The NFL in the 90s was special. In this video, we're going to look back on a decade of record breakers, dynasties, and some of the most excruciating heartbreaks the league has ever seen. In other words, this is the history of the 90s NFL. So what's it going to be, Dion? Football or baseball? Both, boss. Both? Both. Offense or defense? Both. Both? Both. 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 Pizza Hut. Meat lovers or stuffed crust pizza? Both. 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 Want it all? Now Pizza Hut offers our lovers line toppings. Meat lovers, pepperoni lovers, or supreme. Piled high in a stuffed crust pizza. So what'll it be, Dion? 15, 20 million? Both. Both. You'll love the stuff we're made of. The NFL opened the 90s decade with a familiar sight, Joe Montana celebrating a Super Bowl win. The 49ers had gone back to back with Montana outclassing John Elway for his fourth ring. The game cemented San Francisco's status as one of the greatest dynasties in history. For the 1990 season, the quest for the three-peat was on, and the 49ers were consensus favorites. Montana was still at the top of his game. Jerry Rice was so good that he'd been receiving MVP votes for a few years. But what's scary is that the defense in 1990 was arguably better than an offense featuring prime Montana and triple crown winning Rice. Headlined by Hall of Famers Ronnie Lott and Charles Haley, the Niners held opponents to under 15 points a game. With such an incredible roster, the team ripped off 10 wins in a row to begin the season. After finally losing one to the Rams, everyone had their eyes on a dream matchup. The 10-1 49ers versus the 10-1 Giants on Monday Night Football. This would be a battle of the two best defenses in the league. Lawrence Taylor was nearing the end of his prime, but he still commanded devout fear in the minds of O-linemen. Pepper Johnson delivered his best year in the league. The team was the hardest hitting team of the decade, but the 49ers did just enough to win in what was the most watched regular season game ever at that point. In the AFC, the Broncos had their worst year with Elway under center. The Don Shula Dan Marino Dolphins put up their best season in five years, but the class of the AFC was the Buffalo Bills. This would be the first time the world witnessed the dynamic K-Gun offense. This no-huddle system centered around quarterback Jim Kelly calling his own plays at the line, meaning they could shave off extra seconds in between plays, not having to rely on sideline communication. The tempo made it extremely difficult for defenses to keep up with, and when you have a Hall of Famer at quarterback, running back, and two at wide receiver, well, the result is the league's number one offense. On top of that, they had the Defensive Player of the Year in Bruce Smith. In Week 15, the Giants hosted the Bills in another blockbuster matchup. Who wouldn't want to see the number one defense play the number one offense? Ultimately, the scales tipped toward the offense. To make matters worse for the Giants, starting quarterback Phil Simms broke his foot that game and would be out for this season. Backup quarterback Jeff Hostetler was thrust into the spotlight for a team with championship aspirations. Hostetler did a wonderful job limiting turnovers as the Giants stayed hot through the playoffs. In the NFC Championship game, the Giants were set up with a rematch against the 49ers, who still seemed destined for a three-peat. Once again, these heavyweights found themselves in a low-scoring classic. In the fourth quarter, Joe Montana took a severe hit that inserted talented backup Steve Young into the game. With just minutes remaining, the Giants were down by one point and the 49ers were driving. Game on the line and Eric Howard pops the ball loose. Who else but Lawrence Taylor to end up with it? Osteller then got the team in field goal range and the Giants were off to the Super Bowl. On the AFC side of things, the Bills survived a Dolphins shootout, then dropped 51 points on the Raiders in the AFC Championship. From top to bottom, it was one of the most dominant playoff games ever, and they looked primed for their first ring. Super Bowl 25 a rematch of the top offense versus the top defense. The Bills came into the game as a six and a half point favorite. Giants head coach Bill Parcells game plan to slow down Buffalo was to keep their offense off the field. 
That meant no turnovers, steady play from Hostetler, and running the ball over and over again. The Giants utilized running back Otis Anderson to hold the ball for over twice as long as the Bills. But despite controlling the clock, they still trailed at halftime. Then to open the second half, they constructed a drawn out 14 play, 75 yard touchdown drive to give them a 17-12 lead. In the fourth quarter, lightning struck as Thurman Thomas capped off a four play scoring drive giving Buffalo the lead once again. After a Giants field goal, the Bills trailed by one. With the game winding down, they had the ball, and two minutes was plenty of time for this offense. The Giants were dropping back quite a bit to limit the big plays, so Kelly resorted to short plays to move the ball, but that came with using up more clock. With eight seconds left, it was coming down to kicker Scott Norwood. A 47-yarder would be his longest try ever on grass. No good. Wide right. The kick would go down in NFL lore quite simply as wide right. The Giants had won their second Super Bowl in four years. And for the Bills, even with one of the most heartbreaking losses in history, the Buffalo fans were so thrilled with their season that they held a parade of sorts. After all, things sure were looking up in western New York, right? Nineteen ninety one. You had Dan Marino wearing his Zuba's pants every day. Giants head coach Bill Parcells retired due to health issues. The NFL jump-started a world football league that would eventually become known as NFL Europe. During the preseason, Joe Montana suffered an elbow injury that thrust Steve Young into the starting role. The two legit-to-quit Falcons enjoyed one of the best seasons in their franchise history, with dual sport sensation Deion Sanders becoming a constant headline generator. Running back Barry Sanders led the Lions to their best season in the Super Bowl era. The K-Gun offense returned and the Bills lit up scoreboards once again. This year, Andre Reid and James Lofton each put up over 1,000 yards. The Bills O-line was one of the best in the league and Thurman Thomas would capture NFL MVP. But the best team in the league that year was the Redskins. After winning two Super Bowls in the 80s, Joe Gibbs had his most balanced team ever. Of course, you had the latest iteration of the Hogs offensive line. Quarterback Mark Rippon cooked up the best year of his career. Washington also had two receivers top the 1,000 yard mark, and their defense, anchored by Hall of Famer Daryl Green, was one of the best in the NFL. Together, they outscored their opponents by an average of 16.3 points per game. In the playoffs, Washington dismantled the Falcons and Lions, reaching the Super Bowl with ease. Meanwhile, in the AFC, the Broncos had returned to form and matched up with the Bills in the AFC Championship. That game, Denver's defense put forth a heroic effort, but Elway went down and they couldn't convert on field goals. In the end, the oft-criticized Bills defense and Scott Norwood would be the difference in a 10-7 win. Super Bowl XXVI featured the two best offenses in the league. Although the Bills were returning as back-to-back -back Super Bowl participants, they were still the underdog to a more complete Redskins team. Maybe the one thing Buffalo could rely on would be their big game experience. Ironically though, for the first couple plays of their first drive, they were somehow missing NFL MVP Thurman Thomas, who somehow lost his helmet to begin the Super Bowl. That would be a sign of things to come as the Bills offense failed to score a single point in the first half. In the second quarter, Washington broke things open with four consecutive scores. That gave them a 24-0 lead at the half. Although the Bills finally got the ball rolling late, the 37-point output from Rippon and company was too much to handle. Joe Gibbs became the only head coach to win a Super Bowl with three different starting quarterbacks. One of the greatest achievements in coaching history. And that 91 squad will go down in the books as one of the greatest teams ever. 
Before the 1992 season, NFL owners decided to discontinue the slow and controversial instant replay system that had been in place for several years. Packers GM Ron Wolf made the most notable trade of the decade, sending a first-round pick for Falcons backup quarterback Brett Favre. In Week 3, starting quarterback Don Mikowski suffered an ankle injury, which inserted Favre into the game. Things started off so terribly that fans were chanting for third strainer Ty Detmer. Soon though, they would learn of the Brett Favre experience with a last-minute touchdown to win the game. That year, Favre leaned heavily on star receiver Sterling Sharp, who won the receiving Triple Crown. One of the other central storylines around the league was the emergence of Steve Young. Joe Montana was the face of the 49ers, but he still wasn't fully healthy, and Young had played quite well in his place. In 92, Young took another step forward, adding an extra scrambling layer to the tweaked West Coast offense under offensive coordinator Mike Shanahan. San Francisco went 14-2, and, and Young was awarded NFL MVP. Jimmy Johnson's Cowboys were the biggest threat to another Niners Super Bowl. The foundation for this roster lies in the great Herschel Walker trade robbery of 1989. The Cowboys sent talented running back Herschel Walker to the Vikings, and in return, they ultimately gained running back Emmitt Smith, who would become the NFL's all-time leading rusher, safety Darren Woodson, an eventual four-time first-team All-Pro, and three other defensive pieces, including number one overall pick Russell Maryland, first-round corner Kevin Smith, and special teams ace Clayton Holmes. Meanwhile, Walker failed to ever hit the 1,000 rushing yard mark in Minnesota. So with that, it's considered the greatest trade in NFL history. Smith was the third member of the Cowboys triplets, a trio featuring Hall of Fame receiver Michael Irvin and Hall of Fame quarterback Troy Aikman. In 1992, the Cowboys added Hall of Fame defensive end Charles Haley, who previously won two championships with the 49ers. Of course, that year it would be the Cowboys facing off against the Niners in the NFC Championship. Aikman would outduel Young and send the Cowboys to the Super Bowl. After the game, Jimmy Johnson delivered a famous line. You did one hell of a job, and the only thing else I got to say is, how about them Cowboys? Yeah! In the AFC, the Bills opened their playoff quest for a third straight Super Bowl appearance against the Oilers. The previous week, Jim Kelly was forced out of the game due to injury, so backup quarterback Frank Reich was then thrust into action. The onslaught of touchdowns from Oilers star quarterback Warren Moon was too much for the Bills to handle as they fell behind 35-3. In the second half, though, Reich came marching back with four straight touchdowns to lead Buffalo to the then the largest comeback in NFL history. After a divisional win, Kelly then returned for the AFC Championship to take down the Dolphins and send Buffalo to their third straight Super Bowl. At this point, the NFC had won eight straight championships, so even with the Bills' third appearance in a row, the Cowboys were the favorite. Still, things started out great for Buffalo with a blocked punt and Thurman Thomas touchdown. On the Bills' next possession, though, Cowboys safety James Washington intercepted Kelly. Aikman then converted that turnover into a touchdown. Bills get the ball back with the score tied at seven. First play, Charles Haley, boom, and Jimmy Jones takes it into the end zone. From there, the Cowboys more or less had their way all night. Kelly had two interceptions and then re-injured his knee. Reich came in and threw two more picks. Aikman played nearly perfect, throwing for four touchdowns. One notable play came late in the game as Cowboys D-tackle Leon Lett looks golden for a scoop and score, but his showboating cost him as Bills receiver Don Beebe ran him down to force a fumble. Even with the game out of reach, Beebe's play is remembered as one of the great hustle plays in history. Nonetheless, the final score would be 52-17. to Aikman was named MVP, the Dallas defense forced a mind-boggling nine turnovers, and this team looked like it would be the team to beat for a long time. There was one other performance in that game that would permanently change the NFL. Michael Jackson's halftime show increased in viewership over the game itself for the first time ever. And from that point on, more big names in the music industry wanted in on the Super Bowl. In 
1993, Modern Free Agency was introduced as well as the franchise tag. This was largely a win for players' freedom. It also meant that building continued success in the league would theoretically be more difficult, as players could now have success on the team and get paid more elsewhere. The change was immediately felt around the league as Eagles legendary defensive end Reggie White signed with the Packers. The deal made White the highest paid defensive player of all time. The biggest headline that offseason though would be the 49ers trading Joe Montana to Kansas City. The Chiefs were a playoff team the previous season and the hope was Montana would put them over the top. In addition, they also brought in former MVP running back Marcus Allen, a recipe that helped win the AFC West. The Oilers were in a make-it-or-break-it year, and they ripped off 11 wins in a row to end the regular season and finish as the AFC's two-seed. The Bills had a better defense than the previous three years and took back the top seed. For the Cowboys, Emmett Smith missed the first two games of the year while in a contract dispute, that included a Super Bowl rematch versus the Bills, where Dallas could only muster 10 points and drop to 0-2. After that, Dallas made Smith the highest paid running back in the league. He went on to still lead the league in rushing and win NFL MVP. In the regular season finale, he racked up over 200 yards on a separated shoulder to win the division and the NFC's top seed. One of the Cowboys' few losses that year came on Thanksgiving where the Dolphins were lined up to kick a game-winning field goal, but the Cowboys blocked it. The win looked like a wrap. All Dallas had to do was not touch the ball. But in comes none other than Leon Lett, who slips and enables the Dolphins to recover the ball. The win for Miami added another to the tally of Don Shula, who passed George Hallis on the NFL's all-time wins list earlier that season. In the playoffs, Montana's Chiefs made it past the Steelers and Oilers for a date in Buffalo for the AFC Championship. That day, however, belonged to Thurman Thomas, who put up a dominating performance to send the Bills to their record fourth straight Super Bowl. Montana's successor Steve Young also made it to Championship Weekend. He would be facing the defending Super Bowl champions, whose coach was pulling a Joe Namath by guaranteeing a win. Just like Namath, Jimmy Johnson's Cowboys got it done. Troy Aikman was knocked out of the game, but he would return for the rematch versus the Bills. For Super Bowl 28, the Cowboys once again opened as favorites. But after a few field goals and a Thurman Thomas touchdown, the Bills led 13-6 at the half. Aikman didn't look 100%, so the Cowboys needed to lean on their defense and MVP running back. Right off the bat, Leon Lett forces a fumble and James Washington returns it all the way. A crucial momentum swing that dictated the rest of the game. With Washington having the game of his life, the Dallas defense plugged up any and all holes in the second half. Emmitt Smith scored back-to-back -back touchdowns to take the lead and ensure the lead. The Bills defense just didn't have an answer. Smith was named the game's MVP and the Cowboys finished off another Super Bowl blowout. Back-to-back -back champions and the possible formation of a dynasty. On the other side, Pure devastation for the Bills players and all their fans. Going to four straight Super Bowls was an incredible feat, one that no team has ever replicated. But losing all four was inconceivable. From wide right to two Cowboys blowouts, those four years may be the most heart-wrenching stretch a team has ever gone through. And to this day, Buffalo has never returned to the big game. In 1994, football's biggest story was found off the field. After the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, police found matching bloody gloves at the murder scene and on the property of Hall of Fame running back O.J. Simpson. With plenty of other evidence, the police charged O.J. on two counts of first-degree murder. Then on June 17th, 95 million people watched as O.J. refused to turn himself in, resulting in an infamous police chase. Eventually, the standoff ended, an arrest was made, and the nation prepared itself for the so-called trial of the century. 
That same year, the NFL introduced the salary cap. This was a play by the owners to keep free agency costs down. It also increased parity around the league. Coach to quarterback radio play calling was another addition. This wasn't actually a new concept. The Browns had tried it back in the 50s, but the quarterback kept getting calls for a taxi. The two-point conversion was also readopted. The AFL used it back in the 60s, but it was abandoned after the merger. And finally, this would be the first year Fox started broadcasting NFL games. Immediately, the network changed the game by debuting the league's first permanent score bug. This season had some great moments from great quarterbacks. None were bigger than the Elway Montana showdown on Monday Night Football. The Chiefs had pulled ahead 24-21 in the fourth quarter, but with under two minutes left, Elway sprinted into the end zone to take the lead. Now the game was back in Montana's hands with about a minute 30 left. And Joe Cool marched down the field to deliver the game winner. The Chiefs failed to win a playoff game that year, so in a way, this marked the final magical moment from Montana in his final year. About a month later, Dan Marino carried out an iconic game of his own, scoring 22 straight points, with the final touchdown culminating in a fake spike play to fool the Jets' defense. The two best teams in the NFL were once again the Cowboys and 49ers. Dallas had lost head coach Jimmy Johnson in the offseason after a dispute with owner Jerry Jones. Former Oklahoma coach Barry Switzer was pulled out of retirement to take the reins. Dallas bolstered its offense by adding Hall of Fame guard Larry Allen in the draft. But they lost linebacker Ken Norton Jr. to the 49ers, who also just happened to add none other than Deion Sanders. In his first season in San Francisco, Deion won Defensive Player of the Year. The 49ers also drafted Hall of Fame D-tackle Brian Young that year. This roster was stacked up, down, and sideways. Steve Young won NFL MVP. They went 13-3, including a win over the Cowboys. The two teams would meet up yet again in the NFC Championship. This time, the 49ers built a lead off turnovers, and Steve Young finally got over the Dallas hump in the playoffs. Now, with the Bills falling apart, there wasn't exactly a dominant AFC team. In the divisional, the Chargers squeaked past the Dolphins with a clutch final drive from quarterback Stan Humphreys. San Diego didn't really have too many big names. Sure, you had Hall of Fame linebacker Junior Seau and talented defensive end Leslie O'Neill, but really, this team, well, the sum was greater than its parts. The story went the same way in the conference championship, a quality showing from the defense, and Humphreys coming alive at the right time. So that formula sent the Chargers to their first ever Super Bowl. Super Bowl 29. On one side, you have the 49ers looking for their fifth championship and coming out of the juggernaut NFC. On the other side, you have the one-hit wonder Chargers coming out of a conference that had lost nine straight championships. As a result, San Francisco was a Super Bowl record 19-point favorite. Just three plays into the first drive, Steve Young, Jerry Rice, touchdown. Chargers then go three and out. Four plays into the next Niners drive, Young, 55-yard score to Ricky Waters. That's the way it would go all night. Young gets the monkey off his back in dominating fashion, throwing for six touchdowns and winning Super Bowl MVP. Jerry Rice catches three of those touchdowns in one of the best championship receiving performances ever. Deion Sanders became the first player to ever have played in the Super Bowl and World Series. And the 49ers had their fifth championship since 1981. It's no disguise, it's no disguise, it makes no sense, it doesn't fit, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Once again, O.J. Simpson was the story of the year. In 1995, 150 million people watched as O.J. was found not guilty, despite virtually all the evidence pointing against him. The jury's decision was based on feelings and the history of the LAPD instead of the facts presented in the case. There's a whole lot more to it than that, but I'd say that's a topic for another day. So 1995, this was the year where the NFL welcomed two new teams. 
the Panthers and the Jaguars. Meanwhile, LA lost both of its teams with the Rams moving to St. Louis and the Raiders returning to Oakland. Later in the year, Browns owner Art Modell became the most hated man in Cleveland when he announced the team would be moving to Baltimore. That maneuver was met with severe backlash and eventually it was agreed that Cleveland would keep the Browns name in history for when the city received a new team. This year would also signify the ever-changing landscape of the NFL. Dan Marino passed Fran Tarkenton to become the NFL's all-time leading passer and Jerry Rice broke the career receiving yards record as well as the single season yards record. He would once again finish top three in MVP voting. The actual MVP winner that year though would be Brett Favre. The Packers upset the defending champion 49ers in the divisional round, breaking the Niners-Cowboys annual lock on the NFC Championship. Of course, that did mean Green Bay would then be facing off against the Cowboys. This Cowboys squad had lost some veterans due to free agency and injuries, but they made the most significant splash by winning the Dion sweepstakes. After a seesaw first half in the NFC Championship, the Cowboys led 24-17. Dallas's defense tightened up in the second half and Emmett Smith took over the red zone to secure the win. Elsewhere, a Cinderella Colts team led by Jim Harbaugh had upset the Chargers and Chiefs to make it to the AFC Championship versus the Steelers. Pittsburgh had a young head coach in Bill Cower and a quarterback in Neil O'Donnell having one of the best years of his career. From the get-go, it was clear this game was going to take all 60 minutes to win. And in the end, O'Donnell strung together a touchdown drive while the Steelers' defense barely escaped one final Hail Mary attempt. Two of the greatest franchises in the sport going head-to-head. -head. Both the Cowboys and Steelers were looking to tie the 49ers for the most championships. The two teams had previously met twice in the Super Bowl, with Pittsburgh coming out on top both times. The Steelers received a boost in their secondary when Hall of Fame corner Rod Woodson became the first player in history to tear his ACL and return in the same season. One of the most crucial matchups was the Cowboys' Russian attack with Emmett Smith versus the Steelers' stout rush defense featuring Hall of Fame linebacker Kevin Green. Early on, Aikman aired one out to Deion Sanders, playing some wide receiver to set up the offense for a touchdown. Right before halftime, the Steelers were down 13-0, and O'Donnell found his top receiver, Yancey Thigpen, in the end zone. In the second half, something seemed to go awry with O'Donnell. Cowboys corner Larry Brown picked him off twice in the second half to launch a couple scoring drives. Brown was named the game's MVP. As a former 12th round pick who had also lost his son earlier that season, it was a story for the ages. The Steelers defense held Emmett Smith to under 50 yards, but he still scored twice capitalizing off short fields. Dallas had now won three championships in four years cementing a new dynasty. The Steelers were the team of the 70s, the 49ers dominated the 80s, and the Cowboys could now lay claim to the 90s. Charles Haley became the first player to ever win five Super Bowls, Troy Aikman became the third quarterback to start and win three Super Bowls, and Barry Switzer became the second head coach after Jimmy Johnson to win a championship in college football in the NFL. In 1996, the Cleveland Browns were no more and the Baltimore Ravens had come into the picture. Although their inaugural season was nothing to write home about, they did spend their first two draft picks on Hall of Famers Jonathan Ogden and Ray Lewis. Credit where credit is due to Ozzie Newsome, who ranks as one of the best GMs of all time. Also, speaking of new teams, both the Jaguars and Panthers put together impressive seasons in just their second year as franchises. Carolina assembled an imposing defense starring Kevin Green and Sam Mills to lead them to 12-4. And, and under head coach Tom Coughlin, Jacksonville snuck into the playoffs. The Packers took a step forward from their NFC Championship loss, producing the number one offense and number one defense in the NFL. Brett Favre won his second MVP in a row, Leroy Butler and Reggie White were named to all pro teams, and on top of that, they had the best return man in the league in Desmond Howard dominance in all three phases of the game. 
The Steelers won their division again, this time aided by newly acquired running back Jerome Bettis, but their season would die by the hands of the New England Patriots. Bill Parcells had unretired in 1993 and had now led another team to the conference championship. Former number one overall pick Drew Bledsoe put together his best season yet. In the AFC Championship, the Patriots met the Jaguars, who had just pulled off a stunning upset over the Broncos. In this game, though, New England would shut down Jacksonville's offense to advance to their second Super Bowl. Over in the NFC, the Packers took down the 49ers yet again, and the Panthers, just like the Jaguars, had somehow made it to the conference championship in their second year by upsetting the Cowboys. Green Bay would then hand them a dose of reality, topping Carolina 30-13. The biggest storyline leading up to Super Bowl 31 surrounded Bill Parcells and his rift with Patriots owner Robert Kraft over control of the front office. Parcells had turned around the laughing stock of the AFC East, but at this point it was clear he had one foot out the door. Right out of the gate, Desmond Howard dances to a big return and Brett Favre hits Andre Risen for the game's first score. The Packers were soon up 10-0, and as big-time favorites, it looked like another NFC blowout. But Drew Bledsoe then responded with back-to-back -to -back touchdowns to take the lead. After a high-scoring start, both offenses stalled for a bit. Then Favre hooked up with Antonio Freeman for an 81-yard TD, and before halftime, Favre would run one in himself to go up 13. Late in the third, Curtis Martin brought the Patriots within six, and then on the ensuing kickoff, Desmond Howard took it back 99 yards. That would put a bow on it. Howard was named MVP as he racked up 244 return yards, including that backbreaker touchdown. The Packers' defense also stepped up to intercept a Bledsoe four times, and Reggie White delivered clutch pressure late in the game. The Brett Favre-Mike Holmgren combo had turned Green Bay back into title town after two decades of disappointment, and the NFC supremacy over the AFC extended to 13 years. Soon after Super Bowl 31, the Jets hired Bill Parcells. Contractually, though, the Patriots owned his head coaching rights. So the Jets hired Parcells as an advisor, and his right-hand man Bill Belichick as head coach. The Patriots cried foul because it was clear what the Jets' intentions were. So Commissioner Paul Tagliabu stepped in to make both sides happy, with the Jets getting Parcells as head coach and the Patriots receiving several draft picks back. Other offseason news involved the Houston Oilers relocating to Tennessee. Of statistical significance for this year, Barry Sanders became the third player to ever cross the 2000 rushing yard mark in a season. He was awarded co-MVP along with Brett Favre, who put together his third straight MVP season as he led the league in touchdowns yet again. The Packers were legitimate contenders once more and their biggest competition in the NFC would of course be the 49ers. San Francisco still managed to grab the one seed, although their ceiling was limited with Jerry Rice missing extended time for the first time in his career. Steve Young found a new favorite target for the time being with Terrell Owens. They made it to the NFC Championship, but the Packers snuffed their season for the third year in a row, which meant it'd be back-to-back -back Super Bowl showings for Green Bay. In the AFC, the Broncos were set for a rematch with the Jaguars. Star running back Terrell Davis had taken another step forward this year, creating a Hall of Fame trio with John Elway and tight end Shannon Sharp. Davis blew the doors off Jacksonville to exact revenge. Then the Broncos overcame the Chiefs in a nail-biter at Arrowhead. In the AFC Championship, Denver outlasted the Steelers to propel Elway to a fourth Super Bowl appearance. This Broncos team had more talent than its previous Super Bowl iterations, but it was still sort of perceived as a lamb to the slaughter for the NFC. Elway had gone 0 for 3 in Super Bowls thus far in his career, and this would be the team's first championship appearance with Mike Shanahan as head coach. Meanwhile, the Packers had just won it only a year prior. On the opening drive, Favre got things started with Antonio Freeman. The Broncos then did what they had done all year, 
get the ball in the hands of Terrell Davis. At the end of the first quarter, the game was tied, and Denver was hit with a major complication. Davis was suffering from a migraine and losing his vision. Despite not being able to see properly, he was used as a decoy for Elway to take in the team's second score of the day. At the half, the Broncos led by three and Davis received proper medication. Thus, the onslaught of rushes continued, but the most iconic of them all was Elway's helicopter to keep a drive alive and lead to another Davis TD. Broncos now led 24-17. The Favre to Freeman connection then struck again to tie things up, but Terrell Davis couldn't be stopped. He ran in his third score of the day. The Denver D held up on one final Favre drive, and the Broncos had won their first Super Bowl. In the postgame celebration, owner Pat Bolin famously declared his gratitude for Elway. This one's for John. After coming so close so many times, John Elway had finally done it. Everything culminated into this moment. The number one draft selection, the iconic drives, three super disappointments. Now he was finally a champion. Terrell Davis was named Super Bowl MVP, rightfully deserved, but Denver's O-line is worthy of special credit for their performance as well. Like Elway, Hall of Fame tackle Gary Zimmerman and safety Steve Atwater won their first championships as their careers also winded down. Man, the AFC had finally won after losing for 13 straight years. In 1998, Furbies would begin to take over the world, while a quarterback debate took over water cooler talk. Peyton Manning vs. Ryan Leaf Manning was the son of former Saints quarterback Archie Manning and was considered the most polished quarterback prospect since Elway. Meanwhile, Ryan Leaf was thought to have a stronger arm and was considered the better athlete. The Colts owned the number one pick and elected to take Manning. The Chargers traded up to the number two pick and snagged Leaf. Manning's first season had some ups and downs, but generally was building towards something successful. For Leaf, well, three weeks in, he was caught on camera furiously screaming at a reporter the day after a dreadful game. That embarrassment would set the tone for Leaf's career. In late September, ESPN paid $25,000 per game to a graphical engineering company that would place a yellow first down marker during live action. It debuted during a ravens bengals showdown and would change the sport forever. The defending champion Broncos opened the season 13-0. The quest for a perfect season ended after a shocking upset by the Giants. Still, that didn't stop Terrell Davis from becoming the fourth player to rush for over 2,000 yards in a season, just one year removed from Barry Sanders doing it. Davis was named NFL MVP, and the Broncos looked ready for another Super Bowl. Their biggest competition would be found in the NFC. The 15-1 Vikings took the league by storm with one of the best offenses of all time. Veteran quarterback Randall Cunningham had an embarrassment of riches surrounding him. A wide receiver, a pair of Hall of Famers and Chris Carter and Rookie of the Year Randy Moss. Up front, a few Pro Bowlers, including legendary guard Randall McDaniel. And the cherry on top was a top 10 defense featuring another Hall of Famer and D-tackle John Randall. This team looked on track for the Super Bowl, but first they had to make it through a stacked conference. The annual playoff meeting between the Packers and 49ers took place in the wild card round. To close out a wild game, Steve Young found Terrell Owens for the game winner in what became known as the Catch 2 after Amir Joe Montana and Dwight Clark's famous play. The next week, the 49ers had a date with the 14-2 Dirty Bird Falcons. Running back Jamal Anderson emerged that year with incredible production and an iconic touchdown dance known as the Dirty Bird. In the divisional round, Anderson ran through the Niners' defense to advance Atlanta to its first NFC Championship. 
The Vikings had just taken care of the Cardinals, who were coming off their first playoff win in the Super Bowl era. For the conference title, Minnesota led for most of the game. They had a chance to seal it when Gary Anderson stepped up for a 38-yard field goal attempt. Anderson had made every single field goal and extra point he kicked that year. But in the biggest moment, he missed. Next, the Falcons tied up with a last-minute touchdown to send the game into overtime. And in overtime, Falcons kicker Morton Anderson won it with, what do you know, a 38-yarder. It was the cruelest of endings for Minnesota. To this day, the 98 Vikings are considered the best team to ever not make the Super Bowl. After the Broncos took down Parcells' Jets in the AFC Championship, they were set to face their old coach Dan Reeves in Super Bowl 33. There was plenty of speculation about Reeves' feud with Shanahan and Elway and whether this would be Elway's final game. So to begin, fullback Howard Griffith opened up the scoring for Denver. Second quarter, Elway uncorked one deep to Rod Smith to add on to the lead. All the Falcons could do was respond with field goals. Griffith then added another, then Elway took one in himself. Denver's defense forced four turnovers, making the Falcons look outclassed for most of the night. Elway wins Super Bowl MVP. Under Mike Shanahan, the Broncos went back to back. Sadly for Reeves, he would lose his fourth Super Bowl and never return. For Elway, he rode off into the sunset as a back-to-back -back champ, a perfect way to end a career. Elway wouldn't be the only major retirement to hit the NFL in 1999. At the age of 31 and still in his prime, Barry Sanders announced an unforeseen early retirement. Sanders had put together one of the best running back careers the league had ever seen, but the Lions managed to win just one playoff game in that time. So after years of losing, Sanders said his passion for the game had dwindled. Before the 1999 season, NFL owners voted to bring back a new and improved instant replay system. The Cleveland Browns were also reintroduced as an expansion team, and the Oilers changed their name to the Titans. Under head coach Jeff Fisher, the team had gone 8-8 eight eight for three straight years. But this team had young talent. It started with Rookie of the Year Javon Kurse, who forced eight fumbles and tallied 14 and a half sacks. On offense, you had quarterback Steve McNair and running back Eddie George. And they were playing behind one of the best O-linemen the game had ever seen in veteran Bruce Matthews. Elsewhere, the Colts traded world-class running back Marshall Falk to the Rams, but they replaced him with another All-Pro back in Edron James, as they continually surrounded their talented young quarterback with elite weapons to turn their franchise around. The Rams had also clearly hit on talent at the skill positions. In addition to Falk, they had an extraordinary receiving duo of Isaac Bruce and rookie Torrey Holt. After a disappointing season in 98, the team also brought in offensive coordinator Mike Martz and quarterback Trent Green. The arrow was pointing up until Green tore his ACL in a preseason game. Immediately, the spotlight was put on journeyman quarterback Kurt Warner. Earlier that year, the Rams had left Warner unprotected in the Browns' expansion draft. The year before that, he was quarterbacking the Amsterdam Admirals. In a few years before that, he was stocking shelves at a grocery store after a failed tryout with the Packers. So Green's injury looked like the kiss of death. But head coach Dick Vermeil came out in an emotional press conference saying quite simply, we will rally around Kurt Warner and we'll play good football. Next thing you know, Warner's on the cover of Sports Illustrated tearing apart the league. He'd throw for 41 touchdowns, the third most in history at that point. Marshall Falk broke the record for scrimmage yards in a season. The Rams were in the playoffs for the first time since 1989, and Warner had won himself NFL MVP in his first season starting. They were rightfully nicknamed the greatest show on turf. Anyway, as we move into the year 2000, we're still technically concluding the 1999 season. So let's check in on the AFC playoffs. O'Neal at the 25, yeah, give pitches it, to... it back to Wycheck. He throws it across the field to Dyson. He's got something. 30, He's 40, got something. 50, He's got 40, it. 40, He's got 40, it. 20, 10, He's got 5, it. End zone. Touchdown, Titans. There are no flags on 
on the field. It's a miracle. Tennessee has pulled a miracle. That play would forever be known as the Music City Miracle. It was the Titans' first playoff win in Tennessee and would send them to Indy, where they would stymie the Colts' offense. That bought the Titans an AFC championship in Jacksonville. The Jaguars were the AFC's top seed, but both of their losses came against the Titans. And once again, Tennessee had their way, advancing to their first Super Bowl. On the NFC side, the Rams survived a Vikings shootout in the divisional, then edged out a talented Bucks defense in the NFC Championship. Warner's fourth quarter touchdown pass would be the difference maker to send the team to the grand finale. At the height of the dot-com bubble, we have Super Bowl 34. Both St. Louis and Tennessee were each looking for their first Lombardi. The Titans' defense limited the greatest show on turf to just field goals in the first half, yet still trailed 9-0. Midway through the third, Warner padded the lead with Torrey Holt in the end zone. The Titans down 16-0 looked a bit overwhelmed, but Eddie George came roaring back with back-to-back -back scores. Now Tennessee trailed by only three points, and their defense then forced a three and out. So with a short field, the Titans quickly get into field goal range to tie it up. Rams get the ball back with under three minutes to play. Immediately, Warner heaves one up for Isaac Bruce, and he takes it all the way. That looked like the dagger, but the Rams may have also scored too fast, as the Titans had almost two full minutes to respond. McNair willed his team down the field, including this circus play to get into the red zone. Tennessee then spent their final timeout with six seconds left in the game. It is caught by Dyson. Can he get in? No, he cannot. Mike Jones made the tackle. And the Rams have won the Super Bowl. It's a play where time seemingly stopped, and the scales tipped toward one city to win its first Super Bowl. In the end, Tennessee was one yard short as Mike Jones made the tackle on Kevin Dyson. St. Louis, having hosted the Rams for just five years, would be bringing home the Lombardi Trophy. Warner had quickly become the greatest late bloomer in NFL history. His story was the NFL's surprise of the decade, but to him, he expected this outcome. At the time, he said, how can you be in awe of something that you expect yourself to do? With over 400 yards passing, he was named the game's MVP. Before we get to the 90s All-Decade team, I just want to say if enough people have an interest in this video, then I want to make this a series where I do every decade of the Super Bowl era, then create one mega video on the entire history of the NFL. Maybe one day, we'll see I guess. This thing took an extremely long time to make, not only was there a whole lot of information to compile, but tracking down the necessary footage and editing it all together, man, it was a big tasks to complete. All I ask is that if you enjoyed it, then please subscribe for more. And if you have the means, then please consider joining my new Patreon where you can help support the long-term growth of the channel. I'll leave a link in the comments and description for that. As always, thanks for watching and here's the 90s All-Decade team.